Welcome everybody to Radicalize Truth Survives. I'm Heidi Kuda. I'm here with High Fidelity and Jim Stewartson. This is an investigative show about disinformation. Uh, I may as well throw it up too. <laughs> we, are, <laughs> we are on episode 70. We have Dr. Charles Creel with us. We're really excited. We're going to be talking about a lot of things. He is, of course, a digital rights uh, activist. Uh, he also is a filmmaker, people you may know, disinformed, along with his wife, Kat Gellin. Those who stick around are also going to get a sighting of his daughter, Viola. So that's very exciting. Uh, but we do have, we cover a lot of turf with him that's very, very pertinent to this moment in time. And uh, let's just jump right into Front Loaded, guys, because uh, it all it all comes together as we do this work. Front loaded. Uh, those who watched uh, Rad Pod and Chill on Thursday night um, probably saw me quoting from Timothy Snyder's latest Substack. I wanted to share it with you. It's very important. It is called Terror and Counter Terror. It's short. I'd like everybody to read it. The reason being that uh, we continually are emotionally hacked. It's by design. And uh, it, it not only delves into what's happening currently, it delves into what the U.S. did wrong after 9-11. And I just want everybody to be able to, like, with a great scholarly mind, look at what these acts are designed to do to us emotionally. And uh, somehow within that, we must not lose our humanity. Jim? Yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll be talking about this. Uh, a little bit later as well. Um, yeah, these those acts, those atrocities, were a psychological warfare act as much as they were a kinetic one. In fact, I think I would argue almost the entire purpose of it was psychological. It was to incite ancient hatreds that have been weaponized um, by new um psychopaths yeah yeah his timothy snyder who wrote on tyranny yale professor the making of modern ukraine is a, a series that he did at yale that's among my bibles in this war um, but his last line is very important he writes if what you want to do is what your enemy wants you to do someone is mistaken it might be your enemy but it might also be you so i'm gonna just leave it right there hi-fi anything I find um, it's it's got to be obvious to people that blood flowing causes everyone's you know anger to rise, and uh, it, it's it's obvious from the outpouring of emotion we're seeing on the streets of cities around the world uh, that what was done had the intended effect, and now people are again, being more divided and more polarized and ignoring Ukraine at the same time. Thank you for that hi-fi. Um, let's move on to my second item in Front Loaded. Uh, I want to draw everyone's attention to a tweet by Dr. Ian Garner. He, of course, is a uh, Rad Pod um, guest. We've had him on multiple times. He authored Z Generation into the Hearts of Russia's Fascist Youth. He used to live in St. Petersburg, Russia when it was still uh, relatively open. And he is uh, documenting all the time what is happening to Russian children in their own country and how they're being uh, indoctrinated toward totalitarianism. But he also has a keen eye on our own country. And this morning he tweeted, it seems more like the population of a Western country is going to violently overthrow their own government before Russians overthrow Putin. Now, maybe I'm just reading into this, but I believe he's talking about the U.S. I believe he's talking about what Putin's GOP is doing internally right now. There was already a violent attempt to overthrow our own government. We are seeing it occur again in the halls of Congress. And uh, I don't think we should take our eye off that for one second. Gentlemen. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I'm going to preview something that our guests said, uh, which uh, that people will hear. 
which is that there's a proxy war between Russia and the United States happening on the floor of Congress, uh, happening inside of the United States, happening in the media, happening on jitter, right? It, it, and we're just too, too uh, scared to admit what it is, even though we can all see it in front of us. We see the front lines of it. We see the casualties. We see the war. Um, but we just don't want to name it. Absolutely. High five. I would like to point out that uh, actually there there uh, have been a number of Russian successes in proxy wars across the globe, specifically in Africa, in uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, uh, Niger, uh, Sudan. We, we see Slovakia, the, the hybrid war from mean? Slovakia. Yeah, it's it's how it is not obvious to people, how it is not obvious to our politicians. Why aren't our politicians saying something about this? Uh, are they really that big of cowards? I mean, Biden's been coming to bat lately for Israel, which is nice. But how about going to bat for Ukraine? Um, we need to understand we're in World War Three. He has been going to bat for Ukraine. Without Biden, Ukraine would be doomed. So he has been. But I understand exactly what you're saying, Hi-Fi. We are still not naming what is happening to us. We are not naming this global war. Um, and a lot of that is uh, obfuscation by design, which brings me to my last front-loaded item. Uh, I am writing a series on American monsters. I just wrote series number nine on U.S. citizen Elon Musk. This is a series about U.S. criminals accelerating global fascism. I want to cite two quotes from here. One from Dave Troy. Do you understand now that Elon is Putin's guy? And that is a tweet that we talked about that Jim brought up uh, on Rad Pod and Chill the other night. I think it's super important and self-explanatory. And my other favorite quote from this report comes from our friend Wes Clark Jr., uh, who I asked him to give me a quote specifically for the article, and this is what he sent me. Elon Musk thinks he's Plato, but he's just Ayn Rand in drag. That comes from Wes Clark Jr. Uh, in all seriousness, it's a very important look at why this guy continues to get a pass when, as Jim says, he's got a bit of a Nazi problem. So, <laughs> well, uh, as, I, I mean, his grandfather was a Nazi mm -hmm. uh, who literally um, went was on Hitler's side and started a a pro a fascist organization called Technocracy Inc. And when Canada got fed up with them, and he got fed up with the free world, he moved his family to apartheid mm -hmm. in South Africa in 1950, two years after it started, when it was being advertised as a whites-only paradise, wow. quote, unquote. That's when they were moved to South Africa. And he didn't leave until he was going to be forced to go into the army. Uh, but he's, uh, uh, in addition to a Nazi, he's just a huge pussy. Uh, all I know is that I just rewatched Schindler's List and you know how Jason Stanley says that uh, big business backs fascism. Well, that was one of the threads within that film. And, um, you know, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, speaking of business, the, the whole thing with Elon Musk's grandfather was called Technocracy Inc. There's a merger between engineers and, and the, the elite smart smarties of the world who are into technology they were going to run the world and all the all the poors and the lesser intellects were going to just trust them because they were super fucking smart which wow. is exactly what Elon wow. Musk is doing by the way and I'll land my plane he his actual title if you go into the SEC findings filings at Tesla his title is techno king literally his title is techno king because he's living out his grandpa's dream of white supremacist paradise where all the smarties go to fucking mars and all of us stay on earth to die in a fire well today would be a really good day for 
tech reporters and uh, national newspapers to stop reputation washing Elon Musk. <laughs> That'll be, never fucking be a happen. be a real good day for that. It's all it's Alphaville. Do you remember when I made you watch Alphaville Hi-Fi? Uh, basically futuristic, you know, sci-fi by Jean-Luc Godard, where you know the mainframes running people, and it's very much the same thing. Um, so yeah, so that's my front loaded. Thank you so much. Hi fi. I just I, I got to point something out to people. Um, you know, a lot of people look at technology as like, ooh, it's magic and it's going to change the world and make everything better. Um, I would remind people of the history of technology and the ways it's been used. Uh, there was a book written called IBM and the Holocaust, mm. which discussed how IBM uh, enabled the Nazis to track their Jewish victims uh, in the concentration camps. Mm -hmm. uh, this is nothing new. Te technology, technology is a double-bladed sword, right? It, it mm -hmm. can produce awesome things. I mean, we can talk mm -hmm. to, you know, grandma across the country. We can talk to our friends across the world. Um, we can learn news from the other side of the world. It's amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, it can also do a massive, massive amount of damage and uh, for too long now, I think, uh, you know, our lawmakers and those are, who are charged with protecting society have failed in regulating technology and making sure that we only get the good side of the blade. Uh, we're getting too much of the bad side. And the second thing I'd like to say is that Elon Musk is a fucking problem. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Uh, we are going to be talking with Dr. Charles Creel on why we need regulations. <laughs> That's that dirty R word that the libertarians hate, but gosh, we need them. And I'm really glad that the EU is actually, uh, you know, passing laws that we need to do and replicate here in America. So, all right, that's it for Front Loaded Gentlemen. Why does it matter, High Fidelity? Why does it matter? Why high fidelity? All right. First story this week, we're going to talk about good day for Microsoft, bad day for Microsoft. On the good day for Microsoft, Microsoft did overcome its final regulatory hurdle in the EU, allowing it to complete its biggest merger ever. They bought the $69 billion gaming company Activision Blizzard. Mm -hmm. And hey, that's pretty cool uh, because now Microsoft will have a whole bunch of games available to them. But I would remind people, um, you know, Microsoft also got some bad news this week in that they've got a $29 billion tax bill coming from the IRS. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to funnel profits to a teeny tiny factory in Puerto Rico uh, and keep it away from the American tax system. The IRS said, no, that's not going to happen. So Microsoft's having a good day and Microsoft's having a bad day except I would like to remind our audience a little bit about Activision Blizzard because Activision Blizzard just had to pay $18 million in a sexual harassment lawsuit last year. When we talk about these tech bros uh, being unfettered and unaccountable, this would be a pretty good indication uh, that something needs to change in Silicon Valley, in the tech world, and these, these people need to be held to account. So uh, that's I, I, I would like to see a day when there are fewer fines and more, you know, more uh, substantial prosecutions of high level. But fines are, are just a business cost to yeah. that. Yeah. Right. And the fines are literally, you know, portioned out so that they fit within the fucking budgets of these of these companies so that they can do this stuff by the way the video game industry has been a hotbed of of torture of employees and you know um uh harassment for for decades um i you know i come from from the video game industry and you know i can tell you uh it's uh it, it has been a nightmare for a long time um you know. Yes, and also it's also been uh, used in narrative warfare. Hi-Fi, when we interviewed the reporter from the Czech Republic, she talked about some of the free games that actually 
were being kid games where the narrative was pushing them toward their fascist, uh, you know, plot lines. Yes, Jim. Not to mention our, our other guest, Brianna Wu, uh, yeah. who was in one of the most important, um, you know, psychological operations of all time. Uh, she was a target of it, Gamergate, um, yeah. uh, which uh, Gamergate gave rise to, you know, the entire sort of Russian alt-right, you know, plus Chapo Trap House and Bernie Bros and, you know, all of that came from, uh, from, from Gamergate, which was never about games, by the way. But the reason why it was, it was used is because it's got a history of harassment. It's got a history of right. sort of incels, you know, getting what they, they want at the expense of others. And, um, you know, part of, part of what, um, you know, people were, were writing about then that got pushed back on in Gamergate was it was too woke. It was too woke. That was the entire thing. It was the, it were these social justice warriors who were too woke infecting the game industry with their, wow. with their wokeness. That's not familiar to anyone. <laughs> I just it, it 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 blows my mind that people don't see the direct correlation between Gamergate and QAnon when one of the cult leaders of Gamergate is appearing in QAnon movies telling us lies about who Q is. How do you not see that direct network there? It, well, it, I don't understand. It. That may be, it may be a little esoteric. <laughs> it's a lot to unpack there. So I hope that people watching the show do see it. And I will tell you, in rewatching Schindler's List last night, I was very glad that the character Oscar or the man Oscar Schindler, played by Liam Neeson, did get woke. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. He did get woke. Saved a lot of lives because he was fucking woke. So. You know, for what it's worth, uh, these things like Antifa, which is an acronym for anti-fascism. Anti-fascism is good, kids. Woke is good, you know. Woke saves yeah, well, lives. Antifa is a whole thing. Antifa doesn't really exist. Antifa right. was invented by the right wing because they wanted a scapegoat that they could, they could start to scrabble away at the whole idea that fascism is bad, right? So they made made up a pretend anti-fascist thing, you know, with all the guys in the black and the, you know, like, yeah. I'm sorry, but that was performance art. Yeah. All, it, it has been performance art pushed by people like Andy No and Ian Miles Chong and all these fucking assholes because they are fascists and they want to pretend that anti-fascists are the violent ones. That is not the case. And, you know, let's put an end to that. All right. All right. What else, Hi-Fi? All right. So our next story this week, books sell, but who's buying? And this story comes to us because, well, it turns out that uh, the former trader in chief, Donald J. Trump, actually received $5.75 million dollars for a book that was largely photos from the public domain. Uh, I've been saying this for years now, and again, I'm not sure why no one has looked into it. We know that Republicans are doing bulk book buys through their political action committees to push their authors up the bestsellers list. Uh, but then there are a number of smaller, more independent uh, book publishers um, such as Marjorie Taylor Greene's latest book, where they refuse to provide financial statements, and there are hundreds of thousands of dollars that are just magically appearing in people's bank accounts through online sales. One thing I've been pressing on since 2020 is uh, the ability of money to be laundered through the Internet. One of these days, maybe people, maybe the DOJ, maybe the IRS will start paying attention and uh, putting a harsh eye on such actions. 
I, I, I'm glad that you brought this story up because I am so amused uh, by Donald. Do you remember uh, Donald Trump Jr.'s fake number one bestseller? It's exactly this. The RNC spent like, you know, uh, tens of thousands of dollars, like $100,000 to make Triggered a bestseller. Yeah. Nice gig if you can get it. So, so the, the thing that's really important about this is the utilization of money to create a false reality, right? Uh, these, these talking heads, these pundits, they go out there and they parrot, well, I've got a number one bestseller. You should read my book, buy my book, number one bestseller. It's all fake. It's not mm -hmm. real. It's just mm -hmm. propped up by empty dollars. Mm -hmm. People aren't actually reading these books. They're probably sitting in a box in a warehouse somewhere. And until the vast majority of our audience realizes that these these numbers are, are fake, that they're manipulated. Uh, people are still gonna be stuck in this false reality that people are paying for. That's right, and this is a great place for Jim to remind Barnes and Nobles that they should not be selling Mike Flynn's book, which is, uh, you know, has uh, sections on how to kill people. Right, Jim? Yeah, I mean, he's got a book, it's got, he's got a whole book that's about psychological warfare, so it's both a psyop in, in and of itself because it brainwashes you into all sorts of dumb bullshit. Uh, but it also teaches you how to do it to your neighbors, how to how to torture your neighbors with lawfare and 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 attacks and the different ways that you can you know torment somebody, including as Heidi said, a chapter chapter three dash three called "How to Make People Kill People." Yeah. It was not, nice. Not how to kill people, yeah. how to make other people kill other people. Okay. That's this, really powerful. We will, uh, we will come up, uh, this will come up in a minute. All right. All I know is it was nice to see that they were passing the hat, you know, because of Jack Smith's subpoenas yesterday and, in uh, you know, Flynn's uh, reawaken revival or whatever bullshittery was going on yesterday. I'm going to be addressing that. Jill just have to find out. Okay. All right. I'm just going to have to find out. Right. Ooh, the suspense is killing me. Right on. Last item, high five. Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got about four minutes, but all right. Final story this week. We're going to talk about my favorite piece of garbage, how Peter Thiel Link Tech is fueling the Ukraine war. And this is an article that comes to us from Sheer Post. Um, apparently, not having learned their lesson from doing business with Mr. Elon Musk, who was, you know, uh, compromised enough to turn off Starlink in Ukraine, Ukraine is now using a bunch of Peter Thiel Link's technologies, such as his uh, drone company that he funded called Anduril, uh, his facial recognition technology company called Clearview AI and also his data science company called Palantir, uh, which if you are familiar with Palantir, you will know that Palantir was, uh, I mean, if we go back in history far enough, Palantir was, you know, had a plan to co-opt Julian Assange and Glenn Greenwald. Palantir aided Cambridge Analytica in scraping data from Facebook. Uh, Palantir is a big old no good idea and uh, it's being used by governments across the world. I would not trust Peter Thiel uh, as far as I could throw him. Why they are doing this, I don't know, but apparently they haven't got the message that Peter Thiel is in fact a piece of garbage. And that's why it matters. Yeah, they're, the Peter Thiel empire is set up and designed to profit from suffering and death. All of it. You need drones if you have a, a a disaster area, right? You need everyone's fucking data on the entire planet if you want to overthrow governments, right? He he has set up an entire empire to profit from the suffering and death that his own companies create, that his own uh, efforts. To fund things like MAGA 3X, which helped overthrow the 2016 election, 
uh, to, to cooperate with companies like Cambridge Analytica is because he, as he said in 2009, he believes that freedom and democracy are, quote, incompatible. So, so the fact that our fucking government is pouring billions of dollars into a guy whose entire system is designed to profit from suffering and death, who says out loud that that he does not want democracy. Yeah, we have a problem. We have a complicity in our in our you know military uh, you know the government. Um, you know, structures that allows this kind of, psych, psych, you know, organized psychopathy uh, to be, uh, you know, used um, against both our enemies and our own people. I have a quick lightning round question for both of you guys. Mm -hmm. Why, why are Elon Musk and Peter Thiel hitting democracies on so many fronts? I know you just said he says it's in incompatible, but why do you guys think they are attacking us on so many fronts? Nazis. Yeah, Nazis. I think they're Nazis. Man. <laughs> I, but I, but again, I don't mean this. I don't mean it uh, in a in a metaphorical way. I know. Literally, they're they're they come from there. Peter Thiel's. Uh, from there, Peter Thiel spent time in apartheid as well. So did David Sachs, the third member of the PayPal Mafia, who is an overt white supremacist pro-apartheid dude. So, you know, uh, to me, they're they're just doing what they've been programmed to do since they were little kids, since they're little tykes. Elon Musk grew up in a white supremacist a country where it was it was institutionalized I, I get that so I have a dear friend who's from South Africa who grew up in apartheid she's not a Nazi what makes these guys fucking uh, yeah, you know so it's evil psychopathy, psychopathy. okay psychopathy we, right. sort the, we sort the little motherfuckers like Elon Musk who are willing who are willing to do this shit we're willing to make a deal with the devil mm -hmm. to come into a country that's going to welcome you in, make you fucking rich. Yeah. And you're going to, you're going to uh, just literally implant bombs in it and then yeah. set them off, which is yeah. what he's doing. That's he's setting he's them doing. off, setting them he, off right he, now. He, he, he set up Starlink and then he shut up, shut it off over right. the fucking black sea so that his buddy, Vladimir Putin can murder Ukrainians. Yeah, it's so not, it's not a fucking mystery to me. It's a, it's it's what he's been doing all along. And and guess who the largest the largest defense con contractor in the world is? Guess Elon motherfucking Musk. Uh, I would like to say that Dr. Michael McKay, a frequent guest on our show, refers to him as a corporate welfare bum. So he's benefited so much from our big government's largesse. Why is he trying to take it down? Like, it's just, you know. Because he believes he's above it. Ah, because okay. Because he is a messianic narcissist. Okay. And this is, that, that is an important thing. When, when these guys get to messianic narcissism, like Trump, like Flynn, like Musk, like Teal, they believe in their hearts, in their minds, that that what they believe uh, is worth the murder of millions of people. That their vision for humanity, for the world, for themselves, is that much more important and valued than any other human. I think this is important, and people still haven't gotten how important this yeah. is. And, and the thing that is really important is for people to understand, you know, when I was just talking about Gamergate and its connections to 8chan and 4chan, um, when we look at Clearview AI, uh, one of the programmers who helped create 
Clearview AI is a man known as Andrew Ornheimer. Uh, he is also known by his online handle, Weave. Uh, Weave is a member uh, of the internet collective, loosely known as Anonymous. Um, Weave has been around for a long time. Weave is working with Peter Thiel to advance uh, this, this misery and this suffering. And I think people really need to go out and listen to a podcast that Jim and I recorded, Anonymous Rise, Fall, and Payback, where we detail a lot of this history so people can really get a grasp on what kind of monster we are facing. And that is what brings us to Hellscape. Jim Stewartson's Hellscape. Oh, fuck. Um, so I want to talk about uh, what I see as um, a very large global performance of mythology, of ancient religious mythology that's being weaponized and used by psychopaths to generate more power for themselves and escape accountability. In a way, it's the oldest sort of trick in the book. But let me be a little bit more specific, because it's very dark what's happening. We talked about the fact that what Hamas death cult terrorists did the atrocities that it committed, the way it committed them, which was intentionally transgressive, intentionally horrendous, was designed to elicit a reaction. Right? Hamas knows that it's not going to win a war against Israel, because Israel has the United States, has a lot of allies, um, and Hamas is not by itself going to win anything. But Hamas is not alone. And I think it's really important that we, that we understand the context of this, because it's 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 literally a a kabuki performance of of different religious ideologies um, that are being pushed at each other to create a conflict to distract from what to distract from Ukraine. So let me explain. Hamas uh, over the last two years has received a loan, $41 million in anonymous cryptocurrency. No idea where it came from. That was reported in the Wall Street Journal, by the way. Uh, so I suspect that that is not, you know, the last of it. But a total of $134 million has been um, seen going into the coffers of Hezbollah, Hamas and the PIJ, which is a, um, a related entity, all of which are basically Wagner for Iran. So you know what the Wagner group is, neo-Nazi paramilitary that's controlled, that was controlled by Putin. Um, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, you may have heard these are two different things, are basically the Wagner of Iran. So Hamas does all of these atrocities. It knows that what's going to happen is that Israel is going to attack Gaza because that's where Hamas is. And Israel is has been so persecuted and prosecuted and exterminated for millennia that they know the reaction that's going to happen. 
Now, how can this get worse? What if the the guy in Israel who was in charge of making sure all of this didn't happen was an ally of Vladimir Putin? Not only an ally of Vladimir Putin, but propped up Hamas for years. Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likud party for years propped up Hamas in Gaza. Now, 10 days before this happened, before Hamas came into Israel to murder over a thousand people, the Egyptian intelligence minister warned Benjamin Netanyahu directly. And Benjamin Netanyahu did nothing to the shock of the Egyptians. Now, that's pretty bad. What if Benjamin Netanyahu, as the blood is blowing on the streets of Israel, as the the, the war is still happening in his borders. He goes on TV and he lies about that. He says, ah, that's fake news. Literally use the term fake news and propaganda. What happens after that? The walk back. Israel walks it back. Egypt confirms it. And the United States confirms it. The United States says, he was warned again three days before, and nothing happened. Why am I why am I bringing these things up in in the same hellscape? Because Jerusalem, and here's where I'm going to get get a little bit historic on you, but forgive uh, forgive me, it's important. Jerusalem for six thousand years has been the center of uh, a conflict between numerous not just christianity um uh not just islam but dozens of other civilizations over the course of millennia have been attacking invading occupying the same location. What's the most recent sort of sort of version of it? The Crusades. So the Crusades, if you've if you've ever been been in right wing circles, the Crusades are a big deal to them. The Knights Templar. The 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 Romans, right? These are all invading forces that occupied Jerusalem, that fought Islam to occupy Jerusalem. When Jerusalem has been a Jewish state for thirty five hundred years. All of this, all of these people arguing about this tiny little piece of land for thousands of years, right? Because Islam believe, has, uh, believes it is a holy land. Judaism certainly believes it's a holy land, as do Christians. Christians do, if, if you recall, uh, because the Romans had occupied Jerusalem. The Romans had occupied Jerusalem. We are being pushed towards another conflict, yet another in a of hundreds of battles 
and skirmishes over this piece of land. Why? Because of books, mythology that has been around for thousands of years. But I want to remind everyone about one thing. The Bible, the Quran, the Torah come from the same book. It's all just different versions of the same story. And we're just being told these different versions by different people for their own purposes. So for me, what I want is for people to step back and say, hey, you know what? I'm tired of being scripted. I'm tired of being in this fucking play. I don't want to be in another chapter of this ancient blood saga that doesn't matter to anyone. All it does is create chaos and blood and violence again. And why? Because an imperialist Russian war criminal on the other side of the world funds Hamas, visited had had Hamas visit six months before it happened. Six months before that, the leader of Hamas was there. In 2021, the leader of Hezbollah was in Moscow. Iran and, and Putin are close defense allies, meaning they share militaries. So... What what I am the reason why I'm bringing this what is a lot of very big and sort of historic context to this is we need to demystify what the fuck is happening here, right? Because we hear this vague stuff on TV. Ooh, it's a it's like a holy war. Stop it! It's a bunch of stories. And I can respect those stories, and you can believe those stories. But the minute you start murdering people over your fucking stories is the minute that you're no longer in a religion, you're in a death cult. So to, to close this particular hellscape out, I, I, as I've said many times, I am an atheist, but I have no problem your beliefs. Just understand what we're talking about, what we're really talking about. We're talking about a, an argument over a tiny piece of land that's been going on for 6,000 years over, over variations of the same fucking Let's not get scripted into this movie anymore. It's tired. Arrest my phone. I am so damn excited that Dr. Charles Creel is back with us today. He likes to call himself uh, an American carny. <laughs> but what he really is, is a filmmaker, digital policy advisor to the UK's House of Commons and House of Lords. Uh, his latest film, which we have... Um, discussed on our program before disinformed shows how the wellness community uh, has been disinformed with disinformation targeted disinformation it's a very important film to see dr charles creel was also very um involved in writing the digital services act the strongest online privacy uh law in uh the uk so really important work that he does. And I'd like you guys to see a clip of him talking to lawmakers in Trinidad about how they were the original target uh, by Cambridge Analytica SCL to see how it would work as they then targeted the UK and America. 
multimedia is a powerful social factor in defining well this specifically influence someone's behavior in a particular direction in a commercial or political sense it's not an exact science uh, I would agree with you completely, uh, and I think that uh, establishing the efficacy of, of five-factor modeling or any other kind of modeling is incredibly difficult. Uh, you can certainly gather um, enough reports that will come down on either side as to whether this is effective or whether this is not effective. Um, what I would say is the effectiveness of it um, should not have an impact on the pursuit of under uh, uh, the, the pursuit of illegality, um, if data has been gathered illegally, if if someone has gathered a lot of data illegally and then what they've done with it is a mess and doesn't work, it doesn't matter. It's still illegal. Um, if I uh, attempt to murder somebody and I'm just really bad at murder, I'm still an attempted murderer. Dr. Charles Creel, we are so grateful to have you back today. I know that you're also, uh, along with Saving Democracy, you're on daddy duty, so we're going to try to get through this. Uh, I'd like you to tell our viewers a little bit more about what was happening in that clip. So what was happening there is it was an investigation into the work of Cambridge Analytica in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago was a dry run before uh, Cambridge Analytica's work on Brexit and uh, before their work um, in the United States on the Trump campaign. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, which doesn't roll off the tongue very well, does it? Um, the What's interesting there is the leading parties are divided by ethnicity and there are African immigrants historically and Asian immigrants historically, and these two parties are divided. Um, what the campaign that Cambridge Analytica ran uh, was a campaign to get people to not vote, don't vote. That was the whole idea. And they tried to make it look like a grassroots campaign, a street level campaign. They even graffitied parliament uh, in, in the course of this. And it was all about don't vote. But what they knew from having done um, ethnographic surveys is they knew that on the day of the vote, that sure enough, uh, people from the uh, African immigrant community who said they wouldn't vote, didn't vote, but that the Asian kids would do what their parents told them to, and they'd turn up and vote. Mm -hmm. And so the part the whole thing swung um, for that party. Uh, and they managed to change, change the government. So uh, we know that Hillary Clinton in 2016 lost by 77,000 votes. We know that so much of the targeting dealt with voter suppression, trying to make it appear as if this very educated, very um, professionally, uh, she, she excelled at pretty much everything she did. She tried to save her health care. She was a senator, secretary of state. And there was this conflation that she was the same as this reality TV flunky. And that had an impact on our election. and But what you say is so important. It's not even whether or not there is evidence that there was uh, you know, success in these campaigns. It's the mere fact that the way they're doing them is illegal to begin with. Absolutely. And I, it is illegal to begin with. And I think that although some of the tactics are illegal, some of the tactics are legal and they're legislative, like gerrymandering and so on. But what disturbs me most is that um, authoritarian parties don't hide this at all anymore. It, I mean, you know, there was there was a I, I would think there was a time, oh, the halcyon days, but um, when people were a little bit more obscure about this or, or a little l would hide their motivations. Um, but I think now uh, I feel that um, the hard right is just, we're going to steal the election and we're going to tell you we're doing it while we're doing it. It's funny. Jim has been saying that for now a couple of years, that they, they don't even hide this anymore. Uh, before we go any further, because uh, we're going to jump in and talk about the EU's warning to Twitter and Facebook. Before we go any further, remind our viewers of uh, your work and uh, the type of digital activism that you do. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so this all started with me uh, working in conflict zones, supporting independent journalists. Uh, and I've I have a broad portfolio. I've been all around the world, uh, stayed in the worst hotels in the world. That's a good way to look at it. Um, and every dark alley I went down in every country I went to, um, I would find Twitter, Facebook, Google, um, and I would find Cambridge Analytica or another influence agency doing that kind of work. So that led me to uh, be a special advisor to the UK Parliament uh, when they did an investigation into um, into disinformation. At the time, they were calling it fake news. Uh, then the government said officially, we can't use the term fake news. Um, so we did this investigation, and it, I convinced them that we needed to pursue Cambridge Analytica. Um, and so we began pursuing them. And as soon as we began pursuing them, then witnesses and whistleblowers came out of the woodwork. Um, journalists got involved and the whole thing blew up in Cambridge Analytica's face, which is terrific. It didn't blow up quite enough. I was dissatisfied with uh, the outcome. And so I made a film about it. Uh, and the film, along with um, my wife, Katharina Galayan Beacon, um, who, by the way, now the reason I'm on daddy duty is that she's off running Dancing with the Stars in Norway. Um, she's the showrunner there. So that's nice. fun and funny, but I'm, oh. I'm getting a fast lesson in full-time childcare. Um, and, and I have to tell you, I think my job is harder than hers. I'm absolutely 100% sure. And as somebody obsessed with dancing, uh, I realize that dancing is like one of the greatest things and get greatest contributions to civilization. Well, I just want to, I, I want to learn how to dance like Gene Kelly, you know, like oh, oh, OMG. Well, she's definitely traded uh, hardcore politics for glitter balls, at least for a little while. <laughs> but it's a, it's a good a reasonable break. So we, we made two films. Um, one was called People You May Know, um, which is has another title on YouTube. Um, but when it was broadcast around the world, it was People You May Know. On YouTube, it's called Data and Disinformation Investigating Cambridge Analytica. And forgive me, I have to read my notes because I can't remember. <laughs> that. That's um, all right. And then the other one is called Disinformed. Uh, which also has another title on YouTube, uh, which was the disinformation age, why people believe in conspiracy theories. Uh, and essentially what we were doing is we were chasing down uh, why the primary audience um, for QAnon uh, was yoga moms yeah. in, in a nutshell, uh, wow. that it was all around the health and wellness community. So we've made those two films recently and I'm currently uh, developing a, uh, what I view as the third piece of this trilogy, um, which is a documentary series about um, uh, psychopathy in everyday life. Incredible. We're so grateful for your work. The psychology of it is such an important component. And I know that that is your milieu. The reason that Hi-Fi and Jim and I really wanted to bring you here today, despite the fact that uh, <laughs> that you are on daddy duty. So thank you for doing that. My is brother. because the European Union just told Elon Musk uh, last week that he had 24 hours to explain his plans to uh, counter the disinformation and violent videos on his platform, formerly known as Twitter. And that is something that they also have warned Facebook about. And can you speak to our global audience about that? Let's just start right there. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, I mean, the the past week on Twitter and not just Twitter, but other platforms as well, has been one of, of really disorienting disinformation. Uh, it's there's there's videos and 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 claims swirling around. Uh, and and it's I've never experienced this level of, of disinformation and, and feeling quite lost in the middle of it, to be honest with you. Uh, of course, most of the disinformation was around Hamas and Israel um, and the situation uh, that's going on there. We saw lots of videos that ended up not being, in fact, from, um, uh, from Israel at all. Uh, there was, I'm just having a look at my notes here. We had 
One where there was a claim of uh, Hamas capturing generals from the IDF, uh, and in fact, it was a it was a video from Nagorno Karabakh uh, that had to do with the Azerbaijan Armenia war that's happening there. It's a, a place that I've worked and and something that I've worked on. Um, there were claims that uh, the United States there was there was a repeat of a White House press release that billions in aid was going to be sent to Israel. Um, and that was not true. It was a fake account. Um, the CEO, uh, Linda Yakarina, um, said that she'd handled something like less than 100 takedown requests, but she was promoting it as a big number, uh, which I thought was bizarre. Um, and then she went on to say that, uh, that the EU should do more uh, to point to offensive content for Twitter, which to my mind is Twitter saying, we would like to outsource platform moderation uh, to the government. Um, and so if you would do our job for us, um, we'll be able to take these videos down uh, better, which would be a bit like McDonald's uh, asking health inspectors to come in and give them tips on, on trying to keep their kitchens clean. Uh, when people are dying from poison hamburgers. Uh, it, it's, it's just odd. And yet, because of the values of startup culture, because of the values of Silicon Valley um, and the habits of the way that they work, we accept this is quite normal, uh, that you release software that has bugs. You release products that are not ready yet. You, you put all of that off onto your customers and you make them pay for it. Anyway, about a year ago, um, the EU... Uh, passed the Digital Services Act, and they threatened to find Twitter at the time um, and said that they needed to ban profiling of youth on the platform and the targeting of youth with ads. Um, and they could find them as much as 6% of their global turnover. Now, that's $500 million for Twitter, rap a figure that's rapidly going down, I'm certain. <laughs> so, you know, what their global turnover is at the moment, I have no idea. But today, looking at Twitter in my notifications, right at the top was a notification from an account that I don't follow and I've never seen or heard of before. And when I clicked on it, they were trying to sell me sex toys. Yeah. Um, this this is the level of advertising that's happening on Twitter at the moment. Not that I have a problem with sex toys, but I do have a problem with getting served ads for that. Um, and I have a problem with children getting served ads for that as of well. Course, of course. Um, so there are a lot of issues right here. Eventually, Twitter or any of the other platforms could face suspension in Europe if mm -hmm. they don't conform and comply. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens in this space. So Jim and Hi-Fi said when Musk bought Twitter that it was a land grab and an information war. Uh, Hi-Fi also said it was a 44 billion PSYOP cannon to our brains. Um, I think we are seeing that they were very prescient in their, uh, you know, assessment of the situation. Um, I, I want, I know that Jim and Hi-Fi want to jump in, so I'm going to hold my questions. Jim, you go. Um, I just wanted to, to point out that one of the things that uh, Elon Musk has done in his infinite wisdom recently is remove headlines from articles. Mm -hmm. Right. So that the because it, he said it's better aesthetics. And in the meantime, uh, at stock photography and not knowing where it came from. Right. Well, all you're getting is a picture and you, it's you, you have to guess if it's an article or not. And the person, uh, you know, who's who's tweeting can basically tell you anything they want about what's in the article. Uh, you know, because it, it, you don't have anything from the original author except for the photo. To me, that seems like Elon Musk, as he has been doing in general, sort of making information and disinformation flow together as more or less the same thing, right? In an effort to effectively lower the the ability for the population at large to have a, a shared reality right because they can make reality whatever they want um does that i i 
that's just an observation I had. I was curious if that if you. Um, I I agree with you, Jim, and I I feel like it's a play right out of the Prigozhin playbook. Um, it's it's flooding the and if you don't know, Prigozhin is a person who founded the Internet Research Agency, which is Putin's um, uh, propaganda machine online, uh, and has had a profound effect on American politics, but politics globally. Uh, it all started in Ukraine, really, uh, the work that they were doing, but uh, IRA was working domestically in Russia as well. The idea is flood the channel with bullshit. Um, and, you know, we've heard this from the Trump people as well. Um, Bannon is uh, sort of most famous. Bannon, exactly. shit. He was talking about the media, but but Prigozhin was was into the pu public. Go ahead, sorry. What, what, well, what you're doing, I mean, what he what Musk is doing is undermining the authority of institutions. OK, now, you know, the last half of the 20th century um, in certain circles was about critiquing institutions. And that's because institutions needed that critique. Um, but now it's as though some of the most loathsome people on the planet, uh, hippies, have ended up taking over the world. And, and I mean hippies in the sense of people who were like, it's the man, man, I got to be free. And if you take that ideal, which is great, and when I was a teenager, I just thought that was a terrific idea, um, it actually leaves you with no social responsibility whatsoever. Um, and then you grow up and you become a baby boomer. Um, and, and, and this is the situation that, we, that we're dealing with, is, is the, the baby boomers are running the asylum at the moment. Um, and there's a whole lot of, I don't want to pay my taxes. I don't want to be socially responsible. It's not about me, um, but very much about tearing down the institutions. So my question for you is, uh, you, you know, you talked about how the Brexit inquiry kind of blow up and it didn't really hold people to account. Now you were able to uh, hold Alexander Nix to account. Yes. Right. Yeah. Which, and which we perfect, talk a lot he, about. Go ahead. Well, he didn't do time. Um, and and he just went on to other projects, you know, in, in, including being uh, uh, sitting on the board of, of a medical marijuana company in America for a while. Oh, isn't that interesting? Who backs medical marijuana, Russian oligarchs? That's why Dana mm -hmm. Rohrabacher is so involved. But I do need to say, to Hi-Fi's point, uh, you came on our show last year. And you said that right when EU passed the new law and you said the whether or not it has teeth, whether or not it's going to hold the people at the top of the food chain accountable, it has yet to be seen. Have we seen any evidence of that? Well, I think that I think that these threats to Twitter and the other platforms are the beginning of seeing that it, 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 it could very well have I some teeth. So. Um, they are the conversation is suspension now suspending and that is suspending operations for the platform in the EU. One, that's a hell of a lot of money. Um, just, I mean, even Norway has done a little nod uh, toward uh, suspending any kind of data processing and profiling in Norway by Facebook. Um, it didn't mean that Facebook got banned there, but it does mean that they can't do targeted advertising in Norway. Um, and it'll be interesting to watch and see what happens with that. Um, but getting people to talk about actually shutting down Twitter, shutting down Google in the EU, that's a hell of a feat just to get the conversation going. Wow. You know, when I first started advising um, the select committee in Parliament in the UK, um, I started talking to them about, about using antitrust law. Um, in order to shut down uh, some of the social platforms, if that's necessary, and it was, it was as though I had I don't know talked about seeing ghosts or something. <laughs> I was mad. Wow, hi fi. I know there's something else on your mind. I, I've got a couple other things on my mind because this is big for me. Uh, so you held Alexander Nix held his feet to the fire, kind of, but kind there's of. one person. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about Elon Musk, but there's one person that I don't think has been mentioned enough. And that individual was 
he was a uh, founding funder of Facebook, right? And he was a founding funder of Palantir, which is mentioned in this article. Um, Palantir aided Cambridge Analytica in scraping data from Facebook, but nobody ever talks about Peter Thiel's role in this. How can we hold these financiers, these, I mean, these are the people who put these programs into place. How, what can we do? Uh, do we need to amend the DSA? Is there any talk of anything like this in the United States? What, obviously there needs to be accountability and there's none. There's there's some talk in the United States. You know, last year I did a a, a big study um, that was was uh, private uh, for a foundation um, into online political advertising, and what I basically found is that there's almost no regulation anywhere in the world, and that Facebook is just tearing apart. Um, the integrity of electoral systems around the world because of the problems with online political advertising. But in the United States, it was a particularly egregious issue. Um, and just at the federal level, there is nothing being done. Um, now, one of the reasons that nothing is done in many countries is that politicians use online political advertising mm -hmm. in order to get into office and they don't want to lose that tool. Um, and, and so they kick the can down the road in the hopes of doing something later, but it's not going to be done. I, the point that I'm driving at is we need political will and some really bold politicians yeah. uh, in order to make these changes. And they're hard to find. Well, so, okay, go ahead, Jim. Sorry, I just, I, I wanted to follow up uh, on, on this point because I think it also flows into something that you're working on now, um, like you said, which is psychopathy. And the, the fact, to me, I think the underlying problem, um, speaking about Peter Thiel and Mark Zuckerberg and people like that is we've, built a system where psychopathy is a benefit, right, uh, to business uh, in particular. If you can, if you have somebody who's a psychopath at the top of the, of the pyramid making the decisions, they're willing to do things like implement Cambridge Analytica, flip elections, do things like that. Is there any... Um, uh, anything in your your experience that can get people to understand that there is an underlying kind of mental illness that we literally advantage in our society. Um, and, and I don't mean to get too esoteric here, but just because of your tar your your you're studying it, I wanted to to bring that topic in at this point because I think it's very relevant. Yeah, I ran across a, a YouTube video the other day. I I believe it was Mark Anderson I was watching. Um, I'm, but please don't hold me to that. Um, <laughs> clearly, it was a big Silicon Valley investor, um, and they were talking about um, they were talking about how do you handle. Um, difficult stars within startups and companies. Well, difficult stars is a, a, a code word for psychopaths. Um, <laughs> and what, what, he, what he said was, well, as long as they have the best interests of the company at heart, then they can be managed to the benefit of the company, but if they don't have the best interests of the company at heart, then they will be a powerful destructive force. Um, so that is an admission that there are powerful destructive force wow. um, that you can try to harness for your company. Now, I remember back in the 1990s in the UK, there was a big story about Morgan Stanley um, profiling uh, in their HR uh, searches and executive recruiting uh, to try to find people who are on the psychopathic spectrum. 
Um, and, and this spectrum is really interesting to me and it's what fascinates me so much. Uh, um, I interviewed Anders Breivik's prison psychiatrist uh, not too long ago. So Breivik's mass murderer in Norway, <clears throat> hardcore right wing. Wow. Um, and, and I interviewed her and she was talking about how, you know, there are psychopaths and there are some psychopaths who are really very smart. And they live their lives and they get away with what they do. They become CEOs, they become bank presidents, they become politicians and presidents of the United States. And then there are the stupid ones. And they end up here in prison with me, she said. Um, and she was, she was pretty right about that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's fascinating how much of our culture and, and how much of the business and how much of politics is run by people who are on the psychopathy spectrum. Now, we're talking about one in seven people um, exhibit uh, NPD traits, narcissistic personality disorder traits, right? One in seven, that's a lot, that's a lot of folks. So if you can take something like, um, Ron Johnson wrote a, a good book called The Psychopath Test uh, about a literal test for psychopathy. Um, and let's say, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but let's say there's a hundred questions. And if you answer 25 of them in this particular way, you're a psychopath clinically. And it's like, well, what if you just answer 24? You're still a really destructive asshole. <laughs> uh, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's those people who fascinate me because they're your ex who is making your life hell. They're yeah. the boss who steps on every project that you try to do and just won't let you manage yeah. to do anything, um, who insists that you can't work from a home because they want you in the office so they can torture you. They're the cop who gives you a heart. You know, it's, they're there in everyday life. They're the subject of all of our love songs. They're the subject of all of our crime novels. They're, I mean, our society is obsessed with psychopathy. Yeah. We're utterly obsessed with it. Yeah. Um, every good TV show in the last 20 years has had a psychopathic man at the center of it. Yes. You know, from, from just name a few. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard not to name one that doesn't well, have Yeah. It's interesting because in my American Monster series, I just wrote about Elon Musk and I cited Jim Stewartson saying that we continue to sort the sociopath to the top and we need to actually examine that because that is part of why we are in a terrible battle for democracy. Uh, before I, I, there's a burning question I want to ask you, but before we do, I think it's very important we finally put to rest this both sidesism bullshit argument that emerged in 2016 and 2017. Well, Obama did the same thing, except yes, there was micro-targeting, but what the Obama campaign did was legal. We are talking about illegal usage of people's private data. Can you please bury that both sides argument once and for all? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really easy, it's rule of law. You know, you it's, it's not a mystery. Uh, And, and the both, I mean, both sidesism is like what aboutism. Um, what aboutism is uh, just for any listeners who don't or viewers who don't know. Um, when somebody says something about Russia's activities um, uh, in in other countries and manipulating elections and so on, someone goes, "Oh yeah, but the United States, you know." And it's like, that has nothing to do with it. It's like, yes, it's wrong when the United States does it. And yes, it's wrong when Russia does it, but the two don't have anything to do with each other. You know, so the subject on the table was Russia. It's kind of, I mean, you know, I'm sure everyone has been in an argument with their um, spouse or lover uh, where this kind of technique has come up um, and it's, it's, it's maddening. Uh, it, and it, and it doesn't work and it doesn't move things, the conversation forward. Um, yes, the Democrats certainly could process data, but the Democrats claim to function within the context of an open society and within the context of the rule of law. Um, and that's it. 
And uh, unfortunately, the Republicans right now seem to be quite vocal about um, breaking the law, uh, about stealing elections and where they can't steal them, uh, or, or rather where, sorry, where, where they do break the law, if they can get an office then they can change the law before they get convicted for it. And we all are aware that this is what Donald Trump's trying to do. Yeah. And we've seen autocrats successfully change the law the moment they come into office. Uh, one more thing for me, and then Hi-Fi. Hi-Fi, you want to jump in now? I can hold my question. So one of the things I think is relevant that we need to discuss is we know that in 2016, uh, this man right here, Brad Parscale, he ran these campaigns uh, for Donald Trump. And one of the things we know about the illegality of data is we know that Paul Manafort handed uh, Americans polling data to Konstantin Kalimnik from Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, Parscale is back in 2024 <laughs> Trump's campaign. Um, do we have any safeguards in place to stop behavior like this? I mean, Manafort isn't even in prison. No, we, we don't have safeguards in place. And I feel that the, the Justice Department um, and, and the Biden administration should have been more bold in pursuing uh, this and pursuing regulation around it, uh, pursuing the acting parties. Now, I can see an argument for why they haven't done it, but I'm not happy about that. Right. Uh, and I don't necessarily agree. I think um, this coming election is I'm I'm unnerved. Yeah, as are we. And that's why we're very grateful that you are here. I want to read you a quote from Meta when they were also uh, told by the EU that they had, you know, 24 hours to uh, get their act together when it came to disinformation around the conflict in Israel. In an email statement, a Meta spokesperson said that after the attack Saturday, the company created an operations center staffed with experts, including fluent Hebrew and Arabic speakers, to closely monitor the situation. I and this team here does not believe these platforms have ever given any indication that they can self-regulate. So what is our solution to the ongoing destruction that social media platforms are contributing to uh, against democracy? I, I think it's really quite simple and it's regulation. Just regulation yeah. of these platforms has to happen. I mean, you know, they've assembled a panel of experts who, who speak the languages. Well, that worked out really well with Rohingya, didn't it? Um, it's, it's, you know, there was a massacre um, that was caused by Facebook and activity on Facebook um, mm -hmm. and, that's not me making claims. That's from right. the front page of the New York Times. Right. Um, the it's it's very clear that regulation has to happen. The EU has done it. The UK has done it. Um, we've not done it as well as I would have liked us to do it. But you know, I worked very hard on the online safety bill for many many years, uh, and I'm glad to see that it has finally passed. Um, the United States needs to do something. But I don't know how they do it right now, given the current political climate. Yeah. Um, the, the, there is a proxy war um, between the United States and Russia being fought on the floor of, of the House. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. We needed someone to say it. Hi, Fi. I, I, I'd like to get your take on this because I think I have what is a very simple, elegant solution. And, um, I, and, and I was, you know, I've been thinking about this since you and I first met in 20, late 2020. Uh, and it just continues, right? We know that in India, uh, there are, you know, paid digital campaigns. We know that there are paid trolls. Uh, it's very simple. If you are paid, to post something online for anyone, or you are paid to denigrate or interact in any way online, that post needs to be marked as a paid promotion. If you do not do so, the individual who made the post is liable for fines. 
the company that pays them is liable for fines and the platform where they post their, you know, whatever paid information is liable for fines if it is not marked correctly. It seems simple. It seems easy. Thoughts? I think it's, it is simple and easy. If you could get it, get a, a declaration around that to make it the case that they, uh, that the platforms have to do it. But right now the platforms don't even have to mark that a uh, political advertisement is paid for yeah. um, without a click in order to click through to see who's paid for it. Yeah. Um, and the argument initially was, oh, well, the size doesn't work and blah, blah, blah. Come on. You know, yeah. that's it, it. It just doesn't work. Folk don't want to be regulated. When you ask them if if they'll deal with regulation, they're like, well, no, we're for regulation if it's the right kind of regulation. Well, the right kind of regulation is the kind of regulation that is anti-competition. And they would love to see that kind of regulation. Anything that keeps Facebook from having to have any competition, et cetera. You yeah. know, you look at open AI right now and everyone's out there arguing it, the ai ceos are out there arguing against open source well they're arguing against open source saying it's a huge threat which i can see the argument that it's a huge threat but it's also competition so any kind of regulation they can get that's any competitive um therefore so we have a confusion here not only about does regulation need to happen or not but then when we decide that regulation needs to happen, who is actually going to advise governments yeah. about what this kind of regulation is going to be? Because if you get the wrong people in the room, right. the situation will get worse, not better. Um, I think it's a great idea, a great idea, Hi-Fi, what you say. So for two years, we've been reporting that there is a lot of money by the Robert Mercers and the Coke Cadre to continue to... Um, target democracy so it doesn't get in the way of unfettered greed and unfettered capitalism and here we are um i do in the in my uh, report um the cult of the genius tech bro i think it's important that we don't ignore the original funders of platform and twitter and the russian seed money that came through nowhere was that written in the terms and conditions that nobody reads where the original original funding came from and i think that's important because we are a target nation of uh russia's aggression uh hybrid warfare and uh and we are relying on communication platforms that have been shaky from the beginning so that's just something i think that's never discussed enough but what i really would like from you your incredible film disinformed interviewed an anti-vaxxer named Robert Kennedy Jr. And we have Robert Kennedy Jr. now uh, taking that, you know, third position over here, no longer a Democrat, no longer, uh, you know, whatever. And he's just out there doing Russian propaganda all day long. And I had you write a very important piece, I think two very important pieces for Byline Supplement, laying out what you knew and can you please alert Americans what you actually see going on there? Because we know that these vote, these, these major elections are often uh, decided off of margins. And my concern is that people will be bamboozled again. So the thing with Robert Kennedy Jr. is that he has this storied name and the storied name is trusted in the African-American community um, for really profound reasons. Um, I, I was speaking to some people in, in Europe about this recently and telling them about being a teenager growing up in Alabama uh, and every home that I went to uh, that, that was a black family, um, there would be a triptych of, uh, who, who would the triptych be of John, Robert, and Martin, right? And so Robert Kennedy Sr. was held in the same esteem as Martin Luther King. So this is, and, and kids grew up with this. Now his son is running and 
the thinking is it's I mean, it's going to pull the African-American vote or if nothing else, keep them from turning out. Now, I am hopeful that, in fact, that won't be the case, that because he's out spouting Russian propaganda, that voters are a little smarter um, than we tend to think that they are. And he'll pull the vote from Trump. Um, but. You know, every time I've been hopeful about the electorate, it's really <laughs> it's been devastating, right? Thank you for answering that question, gentlemen. What else uh, can we mine from this great mind of ours? Oh, um, I I just wanted to to thank you, um, you know, to for being out there. Uh, there are not many people in the world that um, you know have that spend their lives, um, you know, trying to, to fix what to me is a fundamental flaw in humanity, which is this sort of gap that we've created by, between technology and humanity, right? Where technology has outraced, out, outraced our ability to, to regulate it, to control it. And so we have psych, psychopaths out there um, using that, using this sort of gap between, you know, where our rule of law is and where reality is right. uh, to hurt people. And, and to, to me, um, you know, just your body of work um, is, is very, very important. And I, I encourage everybody to, to watch your films. Um, you. uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. High five. I'm glad you're here. Let's change the world. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's go do it. I, I will never forget my very first conversation with High Five as many years ago where he said, you have to watch people you may know. And I did. And uh, the rest is rock and roll history. Um, thank you so very much for your work. We look so forward to following um, these stories with you because we are not safe in 2023. We are clearly not safe in 2024, but as Jim just articulated so beautifully with you, you know, uh, as a watchdog for all of us, uh, I definitely feel a little bit better. Hi, Viola. I'd like to thank Viola for being incredibly, incredibly patient and well behaved while we all had you our were So good. We barely heard you at all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Viola, for allowing us this time with your father. And now I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. Aww. Go go whoop on him in chess, kid. Yeah, you're going <laughs> to win. Good. What's your favorite? Can I just ask you, what's yeah, your favorite? Papa can't, can't do it very well. That's why oh. I do the different ones. So I let Black start first. Nice. nice. Wow. Okay, yeah, Ray's got right. called out by a two year old. Oh my. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Leo. Bye. 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 Bye.